Aloha friends, this is Dr. Rick Bennett and I'm going to be sharing what we know about Keho Bay and how it is impaired and how further impairments seem to be imminent. My team and I have been studying the coastal waters of Kona for now over 22 years. And Keho Bay has been of particular interest to us because of the fairly intense land use around the bay and the fact that it is probably the most protected embayment or inlet, we might say, on the entire Kona Coast. And recently I have received a number of inquiries in response to the notice of intent to do a draft EIS for proposed development around Keho Bay. But this talk is going to focus on the bay itself and those land uses around the bay that are having and may continue to have impact upon the bay waters. So this effort is part of our Vaibai Ola Ohana family, formerly known as Waterkeepers, and my consulting company called Applied Life Sciences. So this report will be reviewing the significant issues impacting the Bay. It will suggest topics that must be addressed by the Kamehameha Schools Development Corporation draft EIS, which is in preparation at this time. We'll discuss why the vitality of the Bay and its economy and community values are at stake. And we'll discuss how the future health of Keho Bay is our kuleana, is our responsibility. So I have arranged this thorough presentation into four parts to make it more digestible because in one part it would be just too much information, too fast, too quick, and frankly put a lot of people to sleep and that's not what I want to happen. So part one, I'll be talking about sediment transfer and turbidity in the bay. Then there'll be a opportunity to take a break and come back to part two, which is going to discuss nutrient pollution in the bay. By nutrients, I mean the fertilizer nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus and its many forms. Part three is to talk about regional land use and the pollutants that are associated with various types of land use. And then lastly, to offer some public as well as private policy guidance for the future development of the lands around Keho Bay. So make yourself comfortable and I will do the best I can to make this informative and wherever possible even entertaining. So this is a beautiful, beautiful aerial view of Keho Bay. I once referred to it as a bay and a prominent member of the Keho Canoe Club said, no, no, this is an inlet and perhaps it is better called an inlet because the term inlet does suggest that it's small, uh, shallow and atypical of the Kona Coast and it is atypical. This is the only such inlet on the Kona Coast, recognizing we do have a number of bays. There are some bays immediately to the north and to the south of Keoho Bay. It is a very popular place. It has very good public access. It hosts the Keoho Canoe Club, which has hundreds of members from Keiki to Kapuna. People come from all countries to snorkel. Uh, they snorkel in the bay as well as the adjacent Kahalu'u Bay. And so I see Kahalu'u Bay and Keho Bay as brothers and sisters. 
And then there are a number of commercial activities from kayaking tours to the Fairwinds snorkeling tour, which goes down the southern Kona coast to Kalakakua Bay. It is a very popular place and getting more popular all the time with people swimming, motorboats under power. Uh, and so it just gives rise to a little concern on how we're going to keep it a, a fun place and a safe place. So according to Google Earth, Keohoe Bay is a very small inlet, representing from point to point uh, about 18 acres of, of ocean surface. To the open ocean, it's 500 yards long, and between the narrowest points, about um, 75 or so meters uh, out to sea is a narrow point at 149 yards. And it's a relatively shallow bay. Most of the near shore waters in Kona get steep very quickly. And this chart shows that the bay is fairly shallow even as you move out towards the open ocean along the rocky shore. The deepest part of the bay is more or less in the center. And that is where the greatest tidal flows and tidal changes will occur. Tidal exchanges, water circulation is much, much poorer in shallow waters. And you can see the eastern side of the bay, demarked by that green line, uh, is quite shallow with the deepest place, a, a little sandy bottom at about 17 feet of depth. And so the bay has a long history that goes back even before 2012 of being classified as an impaired water body. An impaired water body is a water body that's not meeting the applicable water quality standards. And so the state is obliged to report that to the EPA under Section 303D of the Clean Water Act. And because turbidity is relatively easy to measure with some simple, even handheld instrumentation, the state and its survey people can collect the water sample and do salinity, pH, temperature, and turbidity relatively simply. And so turbidity gets done. And as you see in the biennial report starting at 2012 through 2020, the 2022 report is out. And each of those reports shows Keoho Bay waters as exceeding turbidity standards for a coastal embayment in Hawaii. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means uh, it should be remediated but it's not happening. And then some of you may ask, well, what about the nitrogen content of the bay or the phosphorus content or the ammonia in the bay? Uh, these things do not get tested by the health department because they are a little more expensive, but not that horribly expensive, but the logistics are, are an impediment. And so, it simply doesn't get done. So when you look in the impaired waters report, it shows no listing for nitrogen, phosphorus, and ammonia. It doesn't mean it's okay. It means it was not done. The only thing that get, got done for this bay is turbidity. Now, I'm going to share some data where we, we collected samples. We did the analysis to show that nitrogen, phosphorus, and ammonia are problematic. So an impaired water means that it's not meeting the objectives as written into Hawaii regulations. The Clean Water Act, a federal piece of legislation, requires that when a water quality standard is not being 
obtained um, that a TMDL, total daily maximum load calculation, be done and a restoration plan put into effect to reduce pollutant loadings and restore the water body to its desired state and then being delisted on the impaired waters list. That has never happened for turbidity uh, for Cuyahoga Bay. Other water bodies along the coast have seen some improvements, but not so much for turbidity. Turbidity is a common problem in virtually every site along the Kona coast. And even though it is listed and has been listed, the state has never funded a TMDL for any water body on the island of Hawaii. A few have happened in Oahu and one or two have happened on Kauai, but nothing in Hawaii Island. And it's not because it's not required, it's because there's insufficient funds and insufficient willingness to take it on. So the whole issue of water quality is not what it appears. Most visitors look at our water and say, oh, it's beautiful. And if they're coming from Southern California, our water is often brown, dark brown and dark green. Yes, our water does look better. But what's going on in our oceans and in our bays is below sea level, pun intended. People can't see it, therefore there's no problem. So let's focus back on turbidity here. Turbidity is cloudiness in water that's measured by the ability of the water to trans allow the transmission of light through it. And the more sediment from soils, uh, the more phytoplankton, these are marine plant, plant cells, um, marine single cell algaes, uh, tend to make the water more turbid. My personal experience as a snorkeler and diver is in my 22 years here, the visibility on scuba has dropped by 30, 40, 50%, depending upon the bay and depending upon the conditions at the time. And so there are standards that are developed called NTUs. And the standard for an embayment like Calho is 1.5 NTU. So it's somewhere in between the zero and the two. It doesn't look turbid, but as far as light transmission goes, it is turbid. And the ability of sunlight, both visible and ultraviolet, to penetrate fairly deep in the ocean water is really important for a number of reasons including human health. And so if you dig into the Hawaii Administrative Rules, section 11-54-6, there are values that are published in the Administrative Rules for the parameters um, for water quality. Total nitrogen, ammonia nitrogen, nitrate nitrite, Chlorophyll, the green in green plants, and then turbidities. And these are the limitations. There are some ranges that can be applied over periods of time. But for those Kona shores that exceed standards, not only in turbidity, but in nitrogen and phosphorus and ammonia, I have never seen any evidence of enforcement. Makes me wonder why do we even have the standards if you're not going to enforce them. So Dr. Dennis Mihalka expressed a lot of interest in the chemistry of Keaho Bay and working with Dennis we got him involved in a regular sampling protocol primarily for turbidity, 
Uh, we call him the canoe scientist. And he would go out early in the morning during low tide and take water samples in individual bottles. He had a little rack on his canoe. And then he would take them to his home uh, office, home laboratory, if you will. And he would run turbidity in a machine that he, he bought for his use. He, he produced over several years a mountain of turbidity data. We probably have more turbidity data on Keahoe Bay than any bay in the state of Hawaii, but certainly Hawaii Island. And what you see here is a graph summarizing the data for the period April through December 2014. So these are means of that data. And at shore, the turbidity was 8.0, quite a bit higher than 1.5, I should say. 10 meters, 30 feet from shore, it was 2.2. Then at 50 meters, 150 feet, it's now below 1.5 at 1.2. And then as he worked his way out to sea, and at 500 meters and 800 meters, you're definitely in the open ocean. You're to the west of the Sheraton Resort. At least it was called Sheraton at that time. Um, and the line represents a regression of the data. And that line fits the data with a, a very, very high correlation coefficient of 0 0.9723. 1.0 is a perfect correlation. And so the big white line represents the direction of sampling, and he's stopping at landmarks along the way. And the perpendicular gray line is at about 100 meters or 300 feet. And so the Malka side or land-based side of the bay is where most of the turbidity is occurring which suggests that the source of turbidity is sediment coming from the land. If the turbidity was due to phytoplankton growing in enriched waters, we would see much more turbidity to the ocean side of that line. But on the ocean side, it drops off very quickly. And so what causes turbidity to be a problem in the shallow part of the bay? Well, it is a combination of ground swell ocean waves and wavelets created by the prevailing northwest wind. And when there were storm events and we had big waves in the bay, uh, it was a very, very turbid. But there's a little more to, little more to the turbidity story than just waves and sediment. So here's a chart summarizing the turbidities at three locations, the shore, 10 meters and 50 meters in Keahoe Bay over the period of the year. And you can see the highest readings in aggregate occurred in the summer months. And so what's happening in the summer months in the Keaho region that might be causing turbidity. And one is certainly rainfall. Rainfall in the Kona Coast area is more of a summer phenomena than a winter phenomena. So even though people say Hawaii has a wet season and a dry season, they're reversed for Kona. Summers are a wet season. Winter is our drier season in typical years. And of course, the last 10 years have been somewhat atypical. But by and large, um, this coastal rainfall is a summer phenomenon with, with as much as um, 12 to 15 inches of rain occurring in, in June and July. And of course, what is not shown here is the intensity of that rain. How fast did that rain fall? because a heavy rain over a short period of time is a little different than the same amount of rain over a long period of time. 
hours versus a couple of days. The other thing that's happening in the summer is the ocean's getting a lot warmer. And a warmer ocean is likely to support more microbial growth native to the ocean. These are not human or land-based microbes. These are ocean microbes, including the phytoplankton, which are single-celled uh, plants that grow in the ocean, and they respond to temperature and nutrition. And we'll have more to say about nutrition as we move along. Dennis also took photographs in the water at about 12 inches in depth of this little piece of white plastic with a black line on it. And he attempted to create a visual record of turbidity. And the photographs to the right side of the lines are out in the open ocean between 500 and 800 meters. And as you come more back towards shore, um, turbidity becomes more of a problem. So the, there is a way of visualizing turbidity semi-quantitatively, uh, very useful for teaching uh, young students, young science students about turbidity. But uh, to do it right, we have to rely upon instrumentation. So let's turn our attention now to erosion and sediment. So this is dirts, sand, organic debris that's going to move into the bay as a function of erosion and a rain event. And this has been going on for a long, long time. It's just that there happened to have been some pretty significant rain events in our study period where we were actually able to document and video document uh, erosion and sedimentation of the bay. So the first thing we do in any watershed is look for hardened surfaces. So there's acres of parking lot around the old Sheraton Hotel. There's several acres of hardened surfaces in roofs around the boat ramp and the businesses there at Cuyahoga Bay. All of those hardened surfaces deliver rain runoff downslope to the bay. And in some cases, it's coming directly off of the hardened surface. In other cases, the hardened surface is draining towards the land where it disappears into the lava rock. But just a few feet below the lava rock is ocean water. And so there are many, many diverse, diffuse places where runoff from hard surfaces is flowing into the bay. And of course, water can give everything wings. It dissolves a lot of things or it simply carries a lot of things, including oils and greases. And so those can show up in the bay, especially where you have a direct overland flow. Greases and oils tend to stick to the rocks and not move out into the bay. The other surface that is problematic for the bay are the sand and dirt surfaces. There is a large sand volleyball lot right adjacent to the bay. There is a ramp that comes down from a paved ramp into a dirt ramp and to the beach there in front of the little beach park uh, that also conveys rainwater runoff and sand and sediments into the bay. And so when samples are taken of the bay bottom in the shallow end of the bay, uh, there, there is several inches of sand and sediment in the bay and very little coral uh, growing there. And so rainfall events, once again, can convey a lot of surface runoff and convey a lot of sediment and silt into the bay. So as you go up 
Kamehameha Three um, Drive, there is a long paved segment that is around 39,000 square feet. There is a gravel boat yard at about 40,000 square feet and a parking lot down closer to the bay uh, at 90,000 square feet. Um, and when we get an inch of rain, we're talking about 775 cubic feet of water or 567 gallons. And if that rain comes fast enough, it will move down the steep road. It will move down the, these steep parking lots and across sand and gravel and carrying that gravel as it moves towards the bay. The photograph at the right shows a couple of paths where this water can take. And where that water enters the bay, there are thick, fine sediments on the bottom of the bay. In the cul-de-sac, at the end of Kamehameha Three Drive, is a storm drain. But it really does not connect to a storm sewer or any kind of sewer. It's just a deep hole into the lava rock. And time after time, I and others have witnessed what you see in the photograph in the upper left is where the water is no longer draining. And there's evidence that it overflowed the curb, carrying sand and sediments from that drainage across the berm and down the steep slope into the bay. The picture in the lower right here is the sidewalk leading down to the cul-de-sac and the storm drain. And you can see where water has come across the parking lot and down this embankment, uh, carrying uh, fine gravels and sediment into the street and down ultimately into the bay when it rains sufficiently to fill up the storm drain. Now, I was told by a person who works for the county of Hawaii that the drain doesn't drain at high tide. And yet the water level on this curb is a good 15 or 20 feet above sea level. And so how a high tide could back the water up that far uh, is unclear to me, especially when we know that fractured lava rock almost has infinite drainage. So here's some view of the water flow paths and obvious evidence of erosion taken back in 2014. And so this is not a new problem. Here's similar photographs taken in 2016, this time showing the cul-de-sac almost completely flooded. And the evidence was that the curb overflowed in several locations and several streams were flowing even more directly uh, into the bay. So the picture on the upper right is uh, water coming down from a little higher on the hill and coming across the sand, volleyball lots, down to the stone wall, around the corner, and into the bay. So when you look at this flow from a little higher perspective, you can see we're getting flows across the gravel boat parking lot, flows across the smaller car parking lot, flows coming down Kamehameha Three overflowing the curb and running down into the small park area there, as well as across the sand lot and into the bay. This is a sediment discharge that technically should be permitted or not under the Clean Water Act. If they were doing construction here, the contractor would have to get a discharge permit which regulates the amount of sediment that could flow into the bay as a result of construction activities. When Kamehameha Three Road was built and when the parking lots were put in, uh, no such consideration was given to storm flows and sediment transfer. 
Okay, at this point, we've been talking for a, quite a while, 30 minutes now. Um, so it's a good opportunity to take a break, um, rehydrate, put a pause on your YouTube player, and then come back and resume when you're ready. Okay, I presume some of you have at least come back. Uh, you've awakened yourself from the stupor I put you in. And let's talk about nutrient pollution. So when we talk about nutrient pollution in coastal waters, or in stream waters, or in lake waters, or estuary waters, it really doesn't matter. We're talking about the elements of nitrogen and phosphorus, and the compound called ammonia. Now, if you remember your high school chemistry, if your brain allows that, mine does for some remarkable reason, nitrogen and phosphorus are elements. And as elements, they're in their simplest form. They cannot be converted in nature to other elements. So when nitrogen is in the form of nitrogen, it can't be changed to anything else. It can change forms of nitrogen and phosphorus can have different forms of phosphorus. And ammonia is pretty much ammonia, uh, although it has some unique chemistry depending upon the temperature and the pH of the water. So nitrogen can be in a couple of forms once it reaches the ocean. Most of it is going to be nitrate. And when you buy fertilizer for your lawn, you're typically buying nitrate. Phosphorus is in a similar form called phosphate. And you may recall detergents used to have a lot of phosphates in them. And we tried to switch to low phosphate or no phosphate detergents because both nitrate and phosphate are fertilizers and plants on the land or plants in the ocean are going to respond. Ammonia is a little different in that ammonia represents kind of an intermediate breakdown product between complex chemicals that contain nitrogen like proteins you find in muscle and meat and, and various animal wastes. And when ammonia is present, it seems to represent a fairly recent degradation of a more complex nitrogen-containing compound like blood, like fish guts, um, like human waste that may be getting access to the bay. And as we know, these nutrients play a huge role in invasive algal blooms and coral reef degradation. And so nitrogen and phosphorus above that naturally found in marine waters, tropical marine waters, uh, and because that's usually there in very, very low concentrations. But when those concentrations are exceeded, uh, the marine algaes tend to respond vigorously, much like grass will respond vigorously to fertilization on soil that is nitrogen and phosphorus deficient. So here's some historical data I found oh, somewhere online. Uh, it comes from a a, a marine study that was done in 1977 had something to do with mining the bay bottom. Uh, and so they, they were required to collect some data. Um, over in the upper right hand corner are the l limits for these nutrients in marine waters. And you can see looking down the column there of NO3 nitrate, NO2 nitrite, and PO4 phosphate, that the concentrations are quite low. 
and they do not exceed the um, the state standards in most cases. That's certainly the case for for phosphate. So we have that background data of, of relatively low uh, concentrations. Now, unfortunately, the units in the study are parts per million, and the units in the state regulations are micrograms per liter. And well, we could interconvert them, but let, let's let's be it sufficient to say that the concentration of nutrients in 1977 in the bay, whether at the surface or down at the bottom, were relatively low. And then along comes our team and Dennis taking samples on a regular basis. And then quarterly, we took samples that we sent out to Nelha to the analytical lab out, lab out there for phosphates and nitrates and ammonia. And if you look at the nitrate column going from January 22nd to all the way to the bottom at, at July 30th, uh, the values for nitrate nitrite are quite high. And surprisingly, three of the readings for ammonia, NH4, were quite high. That was unexpected. Uh, the phosphates were elevated as well. And so when we do calculations to account for coastal waters that are a mix of freshwater and seawater, we have to do a what's called a slope comparison. And when we compare the slopes of those regression lines against the slope of the state standard, we find that it does not meet the state standard for embayments. And so, no, 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 and no. And so the Bay exceeds standards. Uh, if the state had accepted our data and submitted it to the EPA, uh, Keho Bay would have been listed as impaired for phosphate, nitrate, and ammonia. But we know that's the case. It's just not officially listed as that. But as we move forward in the future, we have to go from this data to, sh to show that we're not further impairing the bay because the state does not have a baseline for nitrate and phosphate. This data constitutes the only baseline that I know of. And so as we move into the future and we develop around the bay, these are numbers they can't go any higher. In fact, under the law, they're supposed to go lower to meet the standards for an embayment. And so in one of the slides, we talked about surface water flows. And that occurs over hardened surfaces. Most of Kona is not hard at all. It is fractured lava. And so surface water events move downward and downward quickly into the brackish water that underlies almost all the island, but it's very prominent on the Conal Coastal Plain. And so discharges of stormwater, wastewater, septic tank water, cesspool water, leaky sewer lines drains quickly into the brackish water under the land and then the net flow of this brackish water because of the rainfall up Malka up on the hills is out to sea and so being aware of the quality of the water flowing into the bay at the shore is very important because it is the predominant source of nutrient flux into the ocean. It occurs in the groundwater, what scientists now call the subterranean estuary. It's an estuary because it flows both ways, depending upon the magnitude of the tides. 
And so the seaward flow is much greater at low tide than it is at high tide. And it's the reason we do most of our sampling at the shore at low tide. So we're better reflecting what's moving into the ocean. And so we, we did this systematic sampling along what are called transects at various distances out to sea. And here's the transect for ammonia. Notice that the ammonia is higher at tr the area that is close to um, 150 to maybe 300 feet from the shoreline. As we'll see, most pollutants are highest at the shoreline and then decline as it goes out to sea. So what could be happening here is there could be a undersea upwelling. That is to say, fresh water is emerging from the bottom of the bay upward. Or there is a discharge of a waste material, like from a septic tank, uh, somewhere further out to sea in the bay, and it's showing up most prominently at this point and not at the shore. We use salinity as an indicator of brackish water inflow. Uh, 35 parts per thousand is open seawater, and we almost had that at the uh, point there just beyond the, the hotel. But right at the shore, the salinities were the lowest, and then as you move offshore, the salinities uh, get higher, which says there is a very significant flow of fresh and brackish water into the bay as occurs along the entire Kona coast. And so we expect to see the biggest impacts of groundwater at the shore. So the phosphate follows that pattern. The highest values of phosphate are at the shore and it drops way off. And by the time you get to the open ocean, it's, it's a fraction of what it was at the shore. Nitrate similar pattern, but it looks like it doesn't follow the gradient exactly. At that third point, there's 500 uh, micrograms per liter, uh, and it may be reflective of a discharge point that is more lateral and uh, less likely at the shore. Uh, hard to know without but much more intense sampling. So that's the story on nutrient flow. It's in the groundwater, it's flowing into the bay, and it's overnourishing the bay water. And this added nourishment is not healthy for coral. Warmer sea temperatures combine with increased nitrogen concentrations to prom promote coral decline. So it's that time again for a break. Um, step away and let the, let the dust settle, if you will, and come back when we want to talk about uh, regional land use and pollutants. This is important. Welcome back. So regional land use, so what do I mean by that? Um, it's how humans use land and the result of that use often constitutes a source of pollutants. So we say that the pollutants are anthropogenic. That is, they are associated with human activities. Sometimes those activities are most undesirable and perhaps even mismanagement. There are places in the world where I have been where a community has a pipeline of raw sewage that goes right over the cliff into the ocean where I just happened to be snorkeling while on vacation. And I got sick. 
a little less egregious is the pollutants that flow from city streets, uh, collecting stuff that comes out of our cars, collecting the nitrate, that's the nitrogen gases in smog that are picked up by the rain and then turned into nitrate in the water that flows into the sea, um, cesspit leakage, septic tank leakage, uh, leaking sewer lines, uh, misuse of fertilizers on home lawns and commercial lawns like golf courses. So that, that's what I mean by regional land use and pollutants. So let's look specifically at the Caho Bay watershed. Well, a couple of things jump up real quick. Uh, this is the drain in the boat wash area at Keaho Bay. And after the, the Japanese tsunami did damage to the boat ramp, FEMA gave DOBOR, the State Department of Ocean Recreation folks, money to redo the boat ramp. And they replaced or improved this drain because the old drain was plugging up all the time and the wash water was flowing across the parking lot, uh, down into a hole, across the lava and into the bay, which is clearly an undesirable situation representing mismanagement on the part of, of the state. So this drain is put in and I had the naive expectation this drain would connect to the sewer, which runs right by the street there, 100 feet away. But no, this was dug deep down into the lava, backfilled with some gravel, and the boat wash water is allowed to drain down into this, and the bottom of the drain is a mere feet above seawater, which invades between the cracks and crannies in the lava, um, you know, just a hundred feet away. Years ago, we saw a similar pollution problem with the boat wash area at Honokahau Harbor, and it created a trench that became a swamp that was stinky and fetid. And so we took some samples and had a local chemist run them. And that boat wash water was filled with some pretty undesirable components and had character, more characteristic of sewage water than it did uh, simple car wash water. And the numbers are there if you, if, you, if you want to pay attention to them. I'm not going to belabor the point. Let's move on. And so land use around Keaho Bay is a hodgepodge mixture of properties that are connected to sewer and properties that have cesspools or cesspits as more appropriately called in Kona because the toilet water does not pool, it drains straight away. And so there is a small treatment plant uh, in the Heia Peninsula. Uh, it's operated for Kamehameha schools by Hawaii Water. And some of the properties in the peninsula there are sewered, others are not. Some of the properties up Mauka, like the Kamehameha Shopping Center is sewered, but as you go to the subdivision uh, further Mauka, uh, many of those properties are not sewered. Similarly, once you get to Kahalu'u Bay, the, the KIEA wastewater sewer lines in there and there's about a half a mile, three quarters of a mile along the Lee Drive that is not sewered. But let's, let's focus our attention to the peninsula to the north of Keaho Bay. Most of those homes that are in that peninsula are on cesspits. Many of the homes along the waterfront on the south side of the bay are on cesspits. And it is not a matter of speculation that all of those pits drain into groundwater and the groundwater that is flowing into the bay. 
The saving grace, perhaps, is there is some bay circulation, especially in the deeper parts of the bay. And the other saving grace is the water remains fairly clear most of the time to allow the ultraviolet energy of the sun to disinfect the water. This is where turbidity and public health uh, intersect, is we need that ultraviolet light to penetrate deeply into our recreation waters. Now, a lot of people will tell me, oh, Dr. Bennett, look at all those golf courses. They, they surely got to be putting a lot of fertilizer into the bay because they fertilize the golf course, keep it uniformly green. They water it, they water it, they water it to try and keep the golf course beautiful and green. So it's got to be putting a lot, a lot of fertilizer into the bay. And in some situations, especially with brand new golf courses, the first few years can be quite a problem. And I think we have evidence at Kauana Iki up north where it is a problem, especially with the ankle and ponds there. But when we look at golf course fertilization at five to eight pounds of nitrate nitrogen per thousand square feet of golf course, it really doesn't turn out to be that much nitrogen that's being applied. And so my estimate is there's 82 acres of golf course surrounding the bay and it's receiving between 137 and 800 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year. And done right, most of that nitrogen is going to get incorporated into the grass and not flow into the bay. Done improperly, a greater fraction of that nitrogen can leach with irrigation, especially if serious over-irrigation occurs. And then it moves into the groundwater and into the bay. There are many other factors that influence the leaching rate of fertilizer nutrients into the groundwater and into the bay. It's a very complex situation. So I'm taking a very broad brush here and trying to give the situation a simple benefit of the doubt. And so using the reclaimed water from the wastewater treatment plant, there are nutrients in that wastewater. And that is a credit that can be used by astute golf course managers, giving them credit, thereby they don't have to purchase fertilizer for plant needs. They probably have to purchase some, but they certainly have to purchase less. And a nice balance between the climate and the water application helps assure that they're not getting over irrigation and water moving into the groundwater and then into the ocean. Management is critical. But of all the people who are irrigating in the Kona area, from the homeowner to the county recreation fields, the golf course people do the best job of water management. How do we know that? Because of the uniformity of the grass in the fairways and on the greens. It is very uniform, which means they're doing a great job. But now let's turn our attention away from the golf course. The golf course is something we can see and easy to point to and easy to speculate. But the orange areas I have outlined on this aerial photograph are homes that are more than likely, given the sewer maps that we have, to be on cesspits. A household a typical household, and depending upon the nature of their diet, whether it's high protein or low protein, will produce between 12 and 23 pounds of elemental nitrogen per house per year. 
the vast, vast majority of that waste nitrogen is in the urine. It flows into the septic system or cesspit where the nitrogen in the urine is converted to ammonia and then from ammonia into nitrate. Nitrate being a very stable salt of nitrogen moves into the groundwater. And so these homes have the potential to produce 2,700 pounds of nitrogen per year that is not being captured in the grass. It is flowing into the groundwater. And so these 150 homes are putting far more nitrogen into the watershed than 82 acres of golf courses. So when we point to land use in the watershed as being a source of pollutants, we need to point to the home and to the cesspit. Now, just to add a little optimistic hope here, the technology exists to convert a cesspit into a septic system that removes 90% of the nitrogen and 90% of the phosphorus and the vast majority of bacteria, and to do so with a couple layers of sand, sand and sawdust. This technology has been codified in New York State and in Florida and many others along the eastern seaboard. Uh, we are just now playing catch up, but one of the things I work hard to do is to demonstrate this technology and how it can be a cost-effective solution for our cesspool dilemma. So the last part is going to go real quick. No need to take a break here. Thank you for staying with me uh, to cover all the issues that need to be addressed as we move forward. There is public and private policy guidance here that you may not be aware of that I want to share. So the gray box on the right, I'm sorry, on the left, is Article 9 of the state's Constitution. And it says, for the benefit of present and future generations, the state and its political subdivisions shall conserve and protect Hawaii's natural beauty and all natural resources, including land, water, air, minerals, and energy sources, and shall promote the development and utilization of the resources in a manner consistent with their conservation and in furtherance of self-sufficiency of the state. All public natural resources are held in trust by the state for the benefit of the people. As far as I know, Hawaii is the only state in the United States that has a public trust doctrine in its state constitution. I only wish the many agencies in state government had this inscribed on their front door, so they saw it every day. Now let's turn to private policy, and this is the policy statement of the Aina Plan of Kamehameha Schools, and I found this inspirational as well, a little shorter, but just as powerful. Manage our resources and lands to enhance prudent and sustainable use, responsible stewardship, and supportive community relations. I see these two guidance statements as very, very similar. And so I think moving forward, if these two guiding principles uh, steer us in the right direction, the future of Keaho Bay uh, will be assured. So I'd like to acknowledge several people who have collected the data and made this uh, presentation possible. Uh, first, Dr. Dennis Mihalka, the canoe scientist. Dennis has moved off island, but I know he's still very interested in what's going on. And we may hear from Dennis in the near future, as I have a suspicion he's gonna come back, pay us a visit to check up on us. Kathleen Clark of the Kahalu'u Bay Reef Teach and Education Program really helped us uh, get the samples collected and transported with her samples 
to the lab at Nelha. And there I'd like to thank Pamela Madden. Uh, she's the chemist in the water, uh, the water quality lab. A, a very helpful, cooperative person that uh, we're going to work with a lot in the future because they, they do just really high quality lab work there. So I see these as the major issues impacting Keho Bay as we go forward. These topics and more, perhaps more than I haven't imagined, uh, need to be addressed in the draft EIS. So one of the things I will be doing is taking the draft EIS and filtering it through the context of this video and filtering it through our scientific data and our scientific understanding of the bay. The vitality of the bay and its economy and community values are at stake. It's a small inlet with some very intense land use around it. And that land use must be designed and managed such that it protects the bay and assures no further degradation. And if we don't do it now, when will we do it? Because the window of opportunity to protect that bay, to keep it vital, keep it from turning dark green and fish and corals dying, that window of opportunity is closing and closing quickly. Global warming is accelerating that window closure. Nutrient transfer, sediment transfer, is something we can control. We can't control global warming from Keho Bay, but we cer certainly can contribute to minimizing the sediments and pollutants moving into that bay. Mahalo Nui Loa if you've been able to stick with us the, the whole one hour and two minutes this took to, um, to produce, I put it on YouTube so it can get, come back and sampled uh, like a buffet at any time you want. And as you encounter people who are concerned about Keho Bay and its future, please do share the YouTube URL for this video. Uh, it will be up and running 24-7 and you can take advantage of it uh, anytime you like. And it's been a pleasure being of service to my community. I wish you all the great and wonderful spirit of aloha that we call Hawaii. Mahalo.